Well, as we turn to the Word of God, you can follow along in Daniel chapter 12. Uh, Daniel chapter 12, uh, we're going to look at verses 1 through 4 this morning in our study of the book of Daniel. And the title of the message is Our Share in Victory. Our Share in Victory. Now, my family loves books. Everything from children's storybooks to novels to how-to books to research material. If you go through our house, we have many bookshelves that are laden with books. Sarah and the kids, they often go to the library and come back with a stack of books. Um, You can ask Sarah or myself pretty much at any point in time, and we are listening to an audiobook of some sort. With all the online resources, ebooks, digital libraries, we have access to many, many books. Solomon, even back in his day, described the making of books in this way. He said in Ecclesiastes 12:12, 12, 12, of the making many books, there is no end. Books continue to be written and produced and distributed. Well, books exist. Because God designed language to be able to be communicated through writing. In fact, God places great value on the written word. He's the author of the greatest book ever written, the Bible. Now, in Scripture, though, we're also told that God has other books. Books that serve a different purpose than communicating with humankind. In fact, he has books that are part of his record-keeping system. Now, we're not told the exact nature of these books. I can't describe to you, you know, what they look like and all of that. But there are certain books that are mentioned, at least two, that are specifically mentioned in Scripture. Though if you read Revelation chapter 20, there seems to be more than just these two. But two that are specifically mentioned in Scripture. We kind of get a glimpse from Exodus 32, verses 32 through 33. It talks about God having written a book. And then later in the Old Testament, we read in Psalm 69, 28, that there is the book of the living, all right? And there seems to be this book of the living that is a detailed record of all the people who are alive on earth today. All right. Now, God knows this to be true. Um, And is there a literal book that he has? There seems to be an actual book that he has written down the names of the living. So very simplistically, the concept, though right now there are over 8 billion people in our world today, but he has a book that simply has the names of those who are alive. All right. Those who pass away are not in the book. All right, all it is is a record of those who are alive on earth today. All right, that seems to be the idea of one of the books that he has for his record keeping, if you will. Even in John's day, um, when the New Testament was written and the book of Revelation, Revelation was penned, it was common for a city to have a book of citizens. And when one died, their name was erased. It was just kind of this ongoing census that a city would keep. That's kind of the picture of this book of the living. However, also in Psalm 69, there is mention of a role, something different than the book of the living, and that's the role of the righteous, all right? Or a list of righteous ones. So you have one book that just has the names of those who are alive on earth today, uh, kind of distinguishing between those who are alive and those who are dead. But then you have this role of the righteous. And I believe this is also that second book that we find called, El- or that we that is titled elsewhere, specifically in the book of Revelation, but also in Philippians 4, that's called the book of life, right? You have the book of the living. We've already described that, but this is called the book of life. And the book of life is said to contain the names of God's people. So not just those who are alive, but actually those who are God's people. And it is said to be written before the foundation of the world. So the promise is that someone's whose name is in the book of life, that God has written their name in the book of life, it'll never be blotted out. Yes, in the book of the living, your name is blotted out if you die because it's just a record of those who are alive and those who are dead. But if your name has been written before the foundation of the world, if you're one of God's children and your name has been penned there by God, your name will never be blotted out. You can't be removed from God's 
book or his family. Eternal life has been given to you because it's been won by the victory of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's one of the blessings that we share in, in Christ, is eternal life, is a name in the book of life that can never be blotted out. Well, we are really getting near to the end of our series in Daniel 7 through 12 entitled God's Supremacy, Our Hope in a Godless World. And one of the glorious hopes that we have is the hope of victory. As God's people, we have the hope of victory, the the Lord's victory when he returns as, as King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and he is victorious over this evil world. The hope of a victory that results in a glorious eternity with him. That's the comfort and joy that we're going to receive from this passage here in Daniel chapter 12. And the comfort is this, that we will share in the victory of our Lord. Not only is Jesus going to be victorious, but because our names have been written in that book, his book, and we are his people, we share in that victory. So three blessings that we find in our passage here that we share as part of Christ's coming victory. First, we are going to share in Christ's deliverance. And then we're going to share, second, in Christ's resurrection. That's what we sang about just a few moments ago. And then third, we share in Christ's eternal glory. So let's look at that first when we share in Christ's deliverance. Let's read just verse 1 of Daniel chapter 12. At that time shall arise Michael, the great prince who has charge of your people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never has been since there was a nation till that time. But at that time your people shall be delivered. Everyone whose name is what? (laughs) Shall be found written in the book. So we're beginning now to look at the concluding details of this extensive vision that Daniel has received Um, this started all the way back in Daniel chapter 10 and went through chapter 11. Now we're coming to chapter 12. And if you remember back there, the context is Daniel was seeking understanding. The nation of Israel had been freed, as it were, from their exile in Babylon, especially the people of of Judah. They were allowed to go back to the land, but they faced opposition. And so Daniel is really mourning and, and, and seeking understanding before God, saying, why is this happening? Why is this opposition coming against your people? This was supposed to be a time of victory and joy, and yet we haven't seen that. And so Daniel is then told through this vision by God that not so much about what's happening then, but that there is more future hardships and oppression and, and trials for God's people, the nation of Israel, coming. That was all of chapter uh, 11 and how he talked about uh, the Greek empire and the division and then how Antiochus Epiphanes would would be a a great persecutor of the people of Israel during that intertestamental period time um, known as as the time of the Maccabees. But then at the end of chapter 11, we started to read about a a ruler to come that was past that time, that is still in our, even to our day, yet future, the Antichrist is going to come. And and he comes upon the scene sometime in the future during the, the last seven years of what we read about in chapter 9 of Daniel, and that's the 70th week of Daniel. So if you remember, there were 70 weeks, 70 weeks of years. We have that last seven years that we're still awaiting fulfillment of. And this is the Antichrist. He comes on to see a scene during that time and he is called the man of lawlessness. He's called the beast. He's the one that's empowered by Satan through the demonic power and he he raises up himself to position of leadership and power through war and battles. It's those seven years that still await God's calendar that is this time of trouble that we just read about. It's the great tribulation that we read about throughout God's word. And it's during this time that God's judgment comes upon the rebellious nation of Israel, but also against the wicked in this world as well. So Daniel, he says, God says to Daniel, I know you're concerned about what's happening now, but I'm going to tell you about all the trials and hardships that are yet to come against your, uh, against your people. Uh, But these are to work out a great victory because one day, 
that's going to be over. One day, the promises that I have made are going to come to pass. Today, you're in opposition. Today, you have trials because today is not yet that day of victory. But you can trust that I'll see you through today because I've promised victory tomorrow. So one day, we still wait this day, Christ is going to come back. And now, the next thing on on God's calendar, as it were, is the rapture of the church. And Christ is going to come in the clouds and he's going to take his people to be with him. And then, that's when the great tribulation will begin. And God's judgment will fall upon the world. And it, and the first three and a half years is when the Antichrist is rising to power and he's warring and he's making himself a name, if you will, and, and having dominion over the world. And during that time, he makes a covenant with the nation of Israel. And, and at first, he seems to be Israel's savior. But three and a half years into that covenant, he breaks that covenant He is now the the world leader and he then turns his fury and wrath against the nation of Israel seeking to destroy her. And in Zechariah 13, we read that only one third of the Jews will actually survive that time. But God will save a remnant and he will deliver them. And that's what we're reading about here in Daniel chapter 12, that Michael will rise up, this great prince who is charge of your people, and there shall be this time of trouble. But he goes on to say that your people, Daniel, the Jews, that are there at that time, shall be delivered. Everyone whose name is found in the book. So here, God uses the angel Michael, this one described as the great prince who has charge over Israel. In Hebrews chapter 1, verse 14, we read about angels, and they're described there as ministering spirits. And they are sent out to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation. We don't know actually much about the angelic realm, but we do know some things that God has told us. And here, God uses his angels to protect, to strengthen, and to care for his people. If you remember, even during Jesus' life and ministry, angels ministered to him after his time in the wilderness, temptation, as well as in the garden before he went to the cross. But we have also already seen in the book of Daniel that there is, a, there is some suggestion, even from this passage here, that God also gives his angels sometimes charge over nations, specifically over the nation of Israel. Michael seems to have some charge and responsibility to protect and care for the nation of Israel. If we look back in Daniel chapter 10, we see that in the demonic realm, there are demons who do have some charge over the nations of our world even today. And there are a battle over the rulers and the nations in the spiritual realm between God's holy angels and the demonic realm. How does that all work? We don't know, but we know it's taking place today, even today. So here, though, we see that Michael, the one who's called in Jude 9, the archangel, is the one who has charge of protecting and caring for the nation of Israel and his army. Now, is God still the one who's protecting his people? Absolutely. Is he using his angel army to do so? Yes, oftentimes so. But here we say that we see that Michael rises up during this time of the tribulation to protect the nation of Israel. In fact, we find the fulfillment of this passage in the book of Revelation. And in Revelation chapter 12, verses 7 through 9, we read this. Now war arose in heaven. This is probably about that midway point in the tribulation period. And Michael and his angels were fighting against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. But he, the dragon, that Satan, was defeated, and there was no longer any place for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, and the deceiver of the whole world. And he was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. Now, for a season, God has allowed Satan and the demons some access to heaven, to his presence. We know that Satan is allowed to come and even bring accusations against God's people before God. We see that in the book of Job as well. 
But there is coming a time when there will be that great battle about the midway point of the tribulation and Michael will throw down Satan and his angels for good out of the presence there of God. But what will Satan do at this time? He's going to turn his full fury against God's people, specifically against the nation of Israel. We continue to read in Revelation 12, verses 13, And when the dragon saw that he had been thrown down to the earth, he pursued the woman, that is Israel, who had given birth to the male child, that is Jesus. But the woman was given the two wings of the great eagle so that she might fly from the serpent into the wilderness to the place where she is to be nourished for a time, times, and half of times. We looked at that a little bit last week, how God is going to protect a remnant of his people in the wilderness during the great tribulation, and even the Antichrist, empowered by Satan, will have no power over them. And we see here that it is Michael and an angel army that does this work to protect them here as well. Because Daniel 12, 1 says, And there shall be a time of trouble such as never has been since there was a nation till that time. So God says, Daniel, you know what? Israel's going to face, though, during the Great Tribulation, some of the most horrendous opposition it has ever faced. Jeremiah prophesied of the tribulation in this way in Jeremiah 35 through 7. Thus says the Lord, we have heard a cry of panic, of terror, and no peace. Ask now and see, can a man bear a child? Why then do I see every man with his hands on his stomach like a woman in labor? Why has every face turned pale? Alas, that day is so great, there is none like it. It is a time of distress for Jacob, or your translation might call it the time of Jacob's trouble. In fact, you can read through the book of Revelation and find that not only will it be a time of war and political and national unrest, but God is also pouring out his wrath upon the wicked world, and his judgment is going to be experienced through natural disasters. There are going to be earthquakes and there's going to be fires. There's going to be a loss of natural light. There's going to be contaminated water. There's going to be destructive storms. And if that is not enough, there's going to be diseases and plagues and an immense loss of life. No one's going to be left unaffected. And even though that time is a time for the judgment of the wicked, God has also promised that his judgment is going to work out to bring many to righteousness and faith, and repentance. All the way back in Deuteronomy 4, when God was working with the early people of the nation of Israel through Moses, we read this in verses 30 through 31. When you are in tribulation, he's saying that there is coming a time when you're going to rebel and you're going to find yourself under tribulation and hardship. In all these things, the curses come upon you in in the latter days. You will return to the Lord your God. You will obey his voice, for the Lord your God is a merciful God. He will not leave you or destroy you or forget the covenant with your fathers that he has swore to them. So even through the great tribulation, God is going to move to turn the nation of Israel back to himself in repentance and faith. Isn't that what Daniel is told here in verse 1? He says, but at that time your people shall be delivered, every one whose name shall be found written in the book. Not all will be destroyed. And in fact, there will be a remnant. A third of the people will turn back to God. But what we just read here is this. God is the one who delivers, right? He's the one that will deliver his people. Our Savior is, yes, a Savior, but he's also a deliverer of his people. Even though two-thirds of the Jews will perish in the great tribulation, the remaining one-third, Zechariah 13, 9 says, they will call upon my name and I will answer them. And I will say, they are my people. And they will say, the Lord is our God. But even there in Revelation 12, we see that there will be a whole host of even Gentiles that come to salvation during this time as well. There's going to be a great harvest of souls during the tribulation and many of those young believers are going to die for their faith. They're going to be martyred for their faith. But even though they will die, God is saying here they will be delivered. 
They're going to be delivered from further torment. They're going to be delivered from denying God. They're going to also be vindicated swiftly because just in a matter of a few months, the Lord and Savior is going to return as King of kings and Lord of lords. And they'll be with him and be a part of his kingdom for all eternity. So the promise of God's deliverance is is not a promise here that his people are not going to face persecution or hardship or trial or opposition or trouble or distress or even loss of life. But it is a promise that he's going to care for, that he's going to sustain, and that he's going to bring his people through to eternal blessing, to eternal reward. To eternal life. And these are who he delivers, everyone whose name shall be found written in the book. Yes, this is written to the nation of Israel, but this is also including everyone whose name is written in the book of life. That's you and I. If you're a child of God today, your name is written in God's book and your name cannot be erased. It cannot be blotted out. It's a guarantee that you'll be delivered. The greatest hope of this passage, yes, is going to be those tribulation saints that turn to this this page when, 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 when everything is going amiss and God's wrath is evidently seen and they are opposed by the man of lawlessness in the world system and they can turn to this passage and find the greatest of hope. But we have the same promise from this passage they, that they do and that's a promise of deliverance. Jesus will deliver us. Now, we're not going through the great tribulation, but we do have hardships, we do have trials, we do have persecutions, we do have sufferings in this life, especially as we stand up and are bold about our witness for Christ. And God has promised to deliver us because your name is written in his book. You might be called today or this week to face persecution for your faith. You may be called to endure physical hardship and pain. You may be called to even lay down your life for your faith. So how do we endure that? What's with this promise? We cling to the promise that our deliverance is going to come one day. We need not fear what man will do to us. We need not fear the trials. We need not fear the, the hardships of a broken world. We need we not fear when, when life is seeming to flee away or is threatened because that's not the end. When Christ comes to provide that final deliverance for his people, we are going to be there. We're going to experience his deliverance and then that's going to lead us into all eternity. See, at the end of the tribulation, Jesus is going to return as King of kings and Lord of lords, and he sets up his earthly kingdom. And that earthly kingdom, though, then enters into the eternal kingdom. And you know who's with him? We are. We are. His people. If you remember back in Daniel 7, we learned that Jesus is the one who receives the kingdom. Verse 14, and to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away. But it goes on to say in verse 27, this, and the kingdom and the dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given. And we expect to say again to the king, but it says to the people of the saints of the most high. That's amazing. He's going to give that kingdom. He's still king to his people. So, whatever you're going through today, hardship, trial, persecution, opposition, the hardships of living in a sin-broken world, here's the good news. We're going to share in Jesus' victory, and that includes a deliverance from all these things. But we also share in his resurrection, verse 2. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Here's one of the the clearest Old Testament references to the resurrection of God's people. So after hearing of this marvelous future and the promise of deliverance, Daniel needs hope. Because put yourself in Daniel's sandals, if you will, and he hears God say, guess what? 
in the future, there's a deliverance. And Daniel says, I'm not going to be around for that. <laughs> this time he's in his 80s. He's lived a full life. That's great, Lord, but what about us today? So Daniel needs the hope that he's going to actually be included in these promises. And since the final deliverance of God was still in the future, how could someone who is about to die here enjoy those? And the answer is the resurrection. Now, Scripture often uses this imagery of sleep to describe death, and then he does so here in verse 2, and says, And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. Think of it this way. Sleep is temporary, right? Oftentimes we think of death very permanently, but sleep is temporary. So kids, when you go to bed at night, right, and you're like, this is going to be long. I don't want to go to sleep. It's going to be forever before the morning comes. You do have the hope, though, that if you go to sleep, tomorrow you will wake up. It's not a forever thing. You'll be able to enjoy another day. That's the picture used here. The death of God's people is not permanent. It's simply like sleeping maybe a little longer, but one day you're going to wake up to new and eternal life. When God raises your body from the dead, But this is the hope that we have in salvation, right? That's the hope that we do have in salvation. Not only spiritual life, but also physical life, eternal physical life as well. If you remember, who were we without Christ? We were dead. Our sin had earned us death. Yes, that's spiritual death. That spiritual separation from God, but it has also earned us physical death. That's why we die. That's why we go to the doctor and they tell you, your body is falling apart. It's not working properly. All right? I just had the doctor tell me that. It's because we have earned physical death as well. The place of God's we were supposed to have a place of in all eternity in his presence, but we've been separated from that and God had promised that we would die. If you look back at Genesis chapter 5, that's the point of Adam's genealogy there. You read that genealogy and every name except for Enoch, because he walked with the Lord, every name we read ends with this little phrase, and he died. God had been true to his promise that if you rebel against me, you will die. It came to pass. And the place of that eternal death and separation from God is hell. That's the place of God's eternal, righteous, holy, and good judgment upon sin and sinners. That's what we have earned. We needed a deliverer. We needed a victor. We needed someone that could save us from ourselves in our own sin. And that was Jesus. God who took on flesh. He took on humanity. He lived that perfect life that we could not live. And then in grace and love, he took our place in the judgment on the cross. And he endured the holy and good wrath of God against our sins in his body on the tree. But not only did he face that spiritual judgment, but he also physically died, right? He willingly died in our place. And three days he was in the tomb. But what didn't hold him? Death didn't hold him. The grave didn't hold him. He arose from the dead. Acts 2.24, God raised him up, losing the pains of death. Why? Because it was not possible for him to be held by it. He's alive and his resurrection has, has secured our future resurrection. It it has secured and guarantees the resurrection of all his people. In 1 Corinthians 15, 20, he's called the first fruits of our resurrection. He has raised, we know we will too. So this gift of salvation from the judgment to come and, and the gift of forgiveness and reconciliation to God is what we call salvation and accepted by grace through faith. When one repents of their sin, 
willingness to turn away from, from, from loving and clinging to their sin and then instead fully putting their faith and trust and rest in Jesus alone as their Lord and Savior, that one is saved. And they're promised that just like Jesus was raised from the dead, so one day you will be also. But there's also a warning here in the resurrection passage because it does mention that all will be raised. But not all will have eternal life with God. In fact, many will be resurrected one day, those who have died in the rebellion to eternal judgment. Verse 2 continues, and some to what shame and everlasting contempt. For the rebellious, for the unbelieving, they're going to receive an eternal body that can receive eternal pain and torment of God's holy judgment. So there's a serious warning to those who have rejected Christ because they will forever face him as judge. But the hope here in the passage is for God's people because we learned that this resurrection, yes, here he's, he's writing to the Jews and, and that one day there is going to be a resurrection for the righteous believing Jews that come to salvation who are, who die and are even martyred during the tribulation period. But this resurrection includes all of God's people who are written in the book of life. Now, as we compare different passages of scripture that describe the resurrection, it seems like uh, the best way to understand the timeline, like how does this all work out, is that there is going to be a resurrection after the, that seven-year tribulation period, right? You have the seven-year tribulation period, and in Revelation 20, we learn that this resurrection is only going to be for the, for the believers from that time, all right? So we read there in verses 4 and 5, I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus. He's talking during the tribulation period. And for the word of God and those who had not worshipped the beast or its image and had not received its mark on their foreheads or their hands, they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Right? So we have this, this, tie, this resurrection that will take place at the end of the tribulation that is for the people of the tribulation, God's people that died there. There is also, though, we continue reading in, in the book of Revelation, and it tells us here, Daniel kind of just squishes them together and says there's going to be a resurrection for, for God's people and then a resurrection for unbelievers. He just kind of says that's all going to happen. He doesn't tell us when they're going to happen. But Revelation tells us that the wicked are not actually raised to judgment until the end of the thousand-year reign. We continue to read in Revelation 20, the rest of the dead, that's the unbelieving, did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. That's verse 5 of Revelation 20. All right? So we have that. But there is also another resurrection, I believe, that Scripture teaches. And that's for you and I, because we don't go through the tribulation period. And this resurrection actually comes before, and this is what we know as the rapture of the church. And when will this happen? Well, it could be any moment, all right? It could be at any, any time, right? We're waiting for Jesus to come in the clouds and take us to be with him. 1 Corinthians 15, 51 and 52 describes it this way. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, for the trump will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we shall be changed. So this could take place at any moment. Even those who are alive will be resurrected, as it were, and their bodies will be changed as they go up to be with the Lord. So what does this resurrection look like? Whether it's God's people raised during the rapture or his people that are raised at the end of the tribulation period, what does it look like for us as God's people? Well, it's a bodily resurrection, right? It's not just a spiritual resurrection. In fact, when we die, our spirit goes to be with the Lord. Absent from the body, presence with the Lord, right? Our body, though, is as a seed planted in the ground. Paul uses this imagery in 1 Corinthians 15, 37 through 38. He says, And what you sow is not the body that is to be, but a bare kernel, perhaps of wheat or some other grain. But God gives it a body as he has chosen, and to each kind of seed its own body. So he says, When you die, you're, you're, you will go to be with the Lord, your soul will. But your body will be, 
Well, it will return to dust. It will be planted again in the ground. And just like a seed that dies and is planted in the ground, it waits for the day when it will come to life in a new plant. And so that's the imagery that he uses here, that one day, even though you're with the Lord, you don't have that resurrected body yet until Jesus raises your body from the dead. And and though it is that new body that we'll receive is similar to our original body, we see that there's recognition, we'll be able to recognize each other in heaven and so forth, and it is a physical body, it is created to live for all eternity in the new heaven and new earth, it's going to be changed into something uniquely better. It's not going to be touched by sin. It's not going to be touched by disease. It can't be touched by pain or death. It's eternal. It's a physical body that also has spiritual capabilities and capacities. So it is a bodily resurrection that we will experience one day. This body that is falling apart, praise be to God, he's going to remake it one day. And we're going to be whole again. And we're going to be whole before him for all eternity. That's that's one of the promises we have of our salvation. So the comfort that we have in the sin-broken world is this is not the end. Death is not the end. And just as our Savior was raised from the dead, we will be too. Again, The tribulation saints, they'll read this passage one day and as they're facing persecution and martyrdom for their faith, they're going to read this and find the greatest of comfort because they're going to read it and say, I don't need to worry about losing my life for the sake of Christ. It's only going to be planted, as it were, in the ground for a short time, only to be raised one day, very soon. But that's our encouragement as well. We need not be afraid of losing our life. In fact, we've been called to this. Not just physical loss of life, but a willingness to give up all for Christ. Jesus said in Matthew 10, 38-39, And whoever does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. So the loss of life, yes, is not just martyrdom. It's also a willingness to lay down our prideful dreams and desires and our own demands and in, t- and in turn, sacrificially serve God. The living sacrifice of Romans 12.1. It's good to give up these things in order to serve the Lord. This is the heart of faith. It believes and rests in, it embraces serving the Lord, even enduring the trials and hardships of this life. Because we know it's going to be worth it one day. Because God has promised deliverance, and he's promised resurrection the victories of Christ that we share in. But we also share in another blessing of Christ's victory, and that is his eternal glory. His eternal glory. This is probably the most amazing promise here. I mean, they're all amazing. But verses three and four, listen to this. And those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the sky above, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. That's verse three. See, during the great tribulation period, God is going to save and seal uh, 144,000 of his people, of the Jews. They're going to be his witnesses on the earth. And as I mentioned, even from um, Zechariah as well as Revelation 7, we see that there's this great multitude of people that are saved during this time. Even though there are many who will not repent and many will stay in their rejection of God, God will save many people during that time. And those here are described as the wise. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, right? That awe, that reverence for God, that that humility that submits to him, that fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. In fact, the wisest thing that anyone can do in this world is to submit to God is to repent and believe on Jesus as their Lord and Savior. And in the end, those are God's people who he says are going to shine like the brightness of the sky above. Jesus perhaps had this passage in mind when he said in Matthew 13, 43, when the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their Father. In fact, time and time again, throughout Scripture, God's people are described as clothed in white robes, right? In fine linen, 
It's a picture of purity and holiness because our sin was that soiled garment that we wore. Sin destroys. Sin soils. It dirties. It brings things down and breaks things apart. And so there's this picture of a clean piece of clothing put on. Now, we understand this. We have to wash our clothes often, don't we? My family and I, we went up to uh, Palina Lake yesterday. Had a great time. It was beautiful up there. And we did some kayaking and, and, uh, and so forth. But when we got done and we got home, we had to throw our clothes in the wash because between the sunscreen, the bug spray, the lake water, the, the kids were you know, bathing in the gravel you know, on the side of the lake having a great time and all the dirt. They, they were soiled pieces of clothing that weren't fit to be wore anymore until they were clean. That's the picture here. Our sin had soiled us. We needed that cl- cleansing. And Jesus did that through his righteousness. We are clothed in his holiness We are pure and white, a purity that then radiates the splendor and the glory of God. And throughout the Bible, when when God's glory is seen visibly, it is this, this shining bright light of purity. And this we share in, not because of what we have done, but because of who our Savior is. Romans 8, 17, we are heirs of God fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him, in order that we may also be glorified with him. And in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 6 and 7, it says, In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been grieved by various trials. He says there are hardships that come. Why? Here's the purpose. So that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. The emphasis there is the praise, the honor is given to us by Christ. He lets us share in it. This is just the immense grace of God. He has saved us. He's cleansed us. He's empowered us. He uses us. He transforms us. And then we get to heaven and he honors us and rewards us for the work that he did in and through us. And it's not just a token reward. It's not just a little insignificant glory. He says, you know what? You get to share in my glory. you're, You're shining bright like the sun and enduring like the stars. We're sharing his fullness. He says, especially though are rewarded those who are faithfully witnessing and bringing others to Christ. Look at that verse again. And he says, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever. He says, there's this unique blessing for God's people who are about his work leading others to him. We know that God is the one that does the work in the hearts, but he rewards us for our faithfulness and being his witnesses. And that blessing is not reserved for for pastors, evangelists, missionaries, Gideons alone. This is a blessing for believers who faithfully share their faith, who lead others to know God. We talk much here about being a disciple maker and being about the Great Commission. That's, that's what it is. We, 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 we share the gospel, but then we also lead others in righteousness as we encourage others to follow Jesus. And you know what he says? Your reward is eternal for that. You share in Christ's glory for all eternity for that. Now, when we're talking about sharing in Christ's glory, that doesn't mean that we are, we be, that glory becomes ours, okay? And that now we are many little gods. That's not what we're saying when we say we're sharing in his glory. Instead, it has, it, it, what we're saying and what scripture means here is that we en- get to enjoy and participate in it, Right? It's his, but we get the joy of, of being there and participating and enjoying his glory and his wonder for all eternity. I think if we would just get a, just a, just a glimpse of that glory from this passage today, then we're going to be willing to forego our puny, selfish desires here and now, 
Those things that we argue with God about saying, I need this, God. My life should look this way. I must, go, I must have this. I must have that. We're going to be willing to let those things go because we inherit all eternity, the share in Christ's victory and glory. When you're tempted to complain, when you're tempted to despair, when you're tempted to give up, when you question God, remember, Christ has promised you something so much better than anything this world could offer. Anything that you think would make this world the best place ever. So we're called here from this passage to serve by turning others to righteousness, turning others to Christ. Believer, you're surrounded by unbelievers who are still wearing that soiled garment of sin. They need it washed and cleansed. And that's only by introducing them to the one who can wash them and cleanse them, Jesus. You've been blessed to be a blessing, and the greatest blessing you can bestow on someone is the good news of Jesus Christ. But we're also called to wait in this passage. Verse 4 Daniel's told this, but you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Christ is victorious, but his physical victory still awaits a future day. It's not happened yet. Will it happen? Absolutely it will. So we're called to wait. So he says, Daniel, shut up the words, seal the book until the time of the end. Not to hide them. That wasn't the purpose. We have them here today. But really to preserve them. The point was, these are necessary words for generations to know. Seal them up so they have access to them. And it says, many shall run to and fro and knowledge shall increase. Now, the exact meaning of that phrase, I'll admit, there are many speculations exactly what is referred to there. But I believe it may be best to understand this simply to mean that these events are still yet future. There's a lot of running to and fro yet to happen. And knowledge shall increase. And there is coming a time, he's telling Daniel, in the future when these prophecies are going to be better understood. I mean, truthfully, we have a better understanding of these prophecies than Daniel did, simply because we've got to see some of them fulfilled already. And now we have further revelation in the book of Revelation, right? But just think how much more understanding will God's people have that he'll give to his people that are going through the tribulation period and actually experiencing these things firsthand as well. So Daniel is simply told, you can wait. You can wait. The victory is sure. It's coming, but you can wait. So here's the concluding thought. If you're a believer here, you share in the victory of the Lord. All right? You share in that. So are you discouraged today? Are you downtrodden? Are you weary Well, rejoice. Not in those things, but rejoice. This world, its troubles are temporary. But Jesus' victory with all its blessings for us, deliverance, resurrection, eternal glory, those are eternal. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the truth of your word. I thank you, Lord, for the promised blessing that we have of sharing in the victory of Christ. Lord, we admit this world is hard. It's sin-broken, and we have faced opposition for our faith. Uh, We have faced the the hardships of, of physical trial and relationship trials and brokenness. Lord, I thank you that one day we'll be delivered from this all. One day that even the bodies that we have that are falling apart, you will make new that we'll be able to praise you in the fullness for what you made us for all eternity. And Lord, that uh, we will share in Christ's glory for all eternity. We thank and praise you for these truths in Christ's name. Amen.